Contrary to popular opinion, the buildings are neoclassical rather than mission style. Built at a time during which Mission Revival was the official Southern California style, only the most serious buildings, those with the loftiest of intentions and usages, dared to echo the ethos of the Renaissance, a dazzling period of rebirth based on the rediscovery of classical science, philosophy, and inquiry, almost lost to the Dark Ages. It has always been a beautiful building, in a beautiful setting, and this is partly because it says what it means so well. Questioning, hypothesis, experiment, science, in short, when put to use in the service of a democracy, both enhances the common weal and ennobles those who serve. Its nickname was Old Hort, because the Department of Horticulture was headquartered there, flanked by partner department soils on the north and plant pathology to the south. Though not the first buildings, and most certainly not the last, these buildings have come to represent the ideals and achievements of the first hundred years of a one-of-a-kind institution that has impacted both basic science and economies around the world. The institution is the University of California Riverside's Citrus Experiment Station. This is its story. We begin with the rags-to-riches saga of a little town in the hinterland of Southern California. Founded after the Civil War by a handful of retired Eastern doctors and lawyers, Riverside had floundered for a decade before an entirely new cultivar from Brazil, the Naval Orange, transformed the dusty town into what became known as the Queen of the Colonies, the first and largest of the citrus monoculture communities that would dominate Southern California's economy for a century. The Naval Orange was an exotic, and it was subject to the unknown effects of extreme weather, the unknown effects of long-term irrigation on soils, the unknown and continually evolving threat of virus, fungi, and insect on vulnerable root, fruit, and branch. The creation of a citrus experiment station and graduate school of tropical agriculture by the regents of the University of California on February 14, 1907, was a recognition of the fact that Southern California's unique climate and geography would always be, in a sense, experimental, open to great possibilities, yet vulnerable to great unknowns. The experiment station as an institution, therefore, resembled no other. Riverside CES was a virtual Green Rand Corporation, or more descriptively, a monastery on a hill for married Mensa-qualified mendicants, chosen from across the nation for their scientific precocity, and permitted to follow their research where all the unknowns of Southern California's agricultural potential might lead them. And though for decades largely white and male, this handful of isolated characters was surprisingly worldly, traveling the globe and in turn offering hospitality to scientists of like interests from everywhere. They seemed to cultivate idiosyncrasies as vigorously as they did new plant breeds. From one highly respected expert, though genial in every other way, who could not shake your hand or open a door without the intervention of his jacket pocket, all the way to Al Boyce, ex-sailor and enfant terrible, whose tenure was delayed for years due to disapproval of his smoking, drinking, and driving of university vehicles at excessive speeds. But down the decades, great science emerged. Members of the CES Hall of Fame are people like Howard Samuel Fawcett, a devoted Quaker. In 1913, he set about tackling a baffling series of diseases affecting oranges and lemons. He split his attention between temporary cures that kept the industry going and pursuing the more difficult goal of finding the cause. And he did. To Dr. Fawcett, we owe our first recognition of the dangers viruses pose to plants, which led to a whole new branch of science. Homer Chapman lived to be 106. He knew three centuries and was a remarkable jazz pianist. In the meantime, he dedicated himself to soils research and the nutritional needs of citrus. 
He was a pioneer in developing methods to determine fertilizer requirements and methods for leaf analysis for deficiencies that are still standard to this day. After smoking, drinking, and fast driving, Al Boyce's interest was bugs, and he was indefatigable in his work with hitherto unknown pests affecting citrus, walnut, and avocado. In 1951, traveling through Iran, Iraq, India, and Pakistan, he identified new parasitoid wasps that became highly successful examples of the biocontrol of insect pests. A big picture person, a leader by nature, Boyce sponsored new laboratories at the CES and UCR in areas like insecticide chemistry and toxicology. Arriving at Riverside in 1944, George Zentmeyer also traveled widely in search of avocado disease solutions. He located the cause of several diseases in the fungal family Phytophthora found at the tree's roots. Throughout his career, he and his graduate students closed in on Phytophthora through more and more sophisticated analyses of its biochemistry, eventually resulting in effective and safe biocontrol. Zentmeyer was sought around the world as an expert in phytopathology. W.P. Bill Bitters was both loved and feared for his straight talk and arid sense of humor. He worked to develop successful disease-resistant rootstock for citrus, now necessary in orchards worldwide, but his most memorable achievement was almost biblical, as Noah to a most remarkable ark, UCR's world-famous citrus variety collection. Bitters knew that just as stem cells hold tremendous potential for human health, so did the genetic resources contained in the collection and preservation of the staggering varieties of the citrus family from around the world. Roy Fukuto came to UCR CES in 1952 and was an outstanding example of its twin traditions of interest in the effectiveness of chemical pesticides and concern for their dangers. An organic chemist he applied those principles to the development of pesticides with vastly improved mammalian safety, while at the same time he carefully delineated the potential toxic effects of organophosphorates. Pioneers like Roy made the establishment of UCR's Searchlight Environmental Toxicology program inevitable. Murr Muller intended to be a doctor while at Cornell, but it was detoured by his first entomology class. Detoured, but not for long. Murmullah's first project in the Coachella Valley was to attempt to control the eye gnat, a horrible scourge that was capable of spreading pink eye throughout whole schools in a matter of days. His biological control mechanisms reduced the gnat population by 95%, and that was just the beginning. Muller's concern for human suffering led him to work with pharmaceutical companies to develop antigens for mite allergies, with civil authorities to reduce wastewater breeding grounds, and ecologists to develop environmentally safe insect controls. His work as a medical entomologist inspired Coachella Valley citizens to name a unique biocontrol facility in his honor. Vernon Stern took CES leadership in biocontrol, plant biology, and agricultural economics and put them all together. His 1959 paper announcing a new approach called integrated pest management is still recognized as monumental. Stern incorporated high thresholds for pesticide use based on economic analyses to determine best practices wherever agriculture confronts a threat. Stern's leagues of graduate students called Sternites, have spread his practices around the globe. Albert Page is unique in part because he received his Bachelor of Science here at UCR in 1956, his PhD elsewhere, and came back in 1960 to what would become a remarkable career in soil and environmental science. His research centered on trace elements and their deposition in soils via agricultural, municipal, and industrial wastewater deposition. Thanks to Page, the extent and effect of chemical contamination of soils on human health and the ecosystem is far better understood. Toshio Murashigi pioneered in plant tissue culture, work that led from traditional breeding methods to breakthroughs in genetic engineering. He taught the world how to routinely develop whole plants from single cells. Dr. Murashigi's work has spawned vast industries in plant cell biotechnology 
and agricultural science will never be the same because of him. Noel Keane let nothing stand in his way in his effort to know as much as possible about the biochemistry of hosts and parasites and the pathology of plants. He coined the term elicitor for pathogenic chemicals he discovered. In the process of his research, he broke ground in new areas of molecular and genetic biology. His work led the way toward the first successful efforts to manipulate host pathogen behavior on the level of proteins. Knowles' peers at UCR dedicated Keen Hall in his honor in recognition of his breadth of vision and his pioneering achievements. William Jury is an outstanding example of how CES research agendas, originally in service only to agriculture, now underpin the broader concerns of environmental safety. Jury is a world-recognized expert in the movement of chemical residues through soil into groundwater. Work like his has transformed the agricultural chemical industry by inspiring stricter and wiser government regulation. We owe so much of what is safer about our environment now to researchers like William Jury. Natasha Reichel is a world authority on plant cell biology. Her interests are at a genetic level, but she applies a wide-ranging, multidisciplinary approach to research. Cellular, molecular, genetic, proteomic, chemical. Her wide-ranging personal facility has helped spawn UCR's latest facility, the state-of-the-art Genomics Institute, under construction now. The Citrus Experiment Station would have had a world reputation if it had stood alone. But in 1954, the University of California established a College of Letters and Sciences on ground just north of CES headquarters. Thus, UC Riverside was born. And the remarkable synthesis of the experiment station's established excellence in practical research with the new college's dedication to undergraduate education began. The opportunities afforded the CES by integration into the broader framework of the university have not diminished over time. And UCR's undergraduates continue to benefit from hands-on research activities provided by life science faculty who, true to tradition, regularly break through across the scientific spectrum. UCR biocontrol initiatives eradicated the ash white fly in the 80s and will certainly do so again with the glassy wing sharpshooter in citrus and grapes. And recently, better varieties of citrus and asparagus a new flood-tolerant rice, and corn with twice the protein and half the carbohydrates. From soil and groundwater studies and early research on the effects of air pollution on plants and humans to broad initiatives in environmental engineering. From plant breeding to the Genomics Institute. From medical entomology to a medical school. The hundred-year roots of UC Riverside's Citrus Experiment Station are the only root stock our scientists have never needed to improve. The branches are vast. Each new harvest is as good as the last, and the yield only increases. The achievements, the new approaches, the research pathways laid down by UCR's Citrus Experiment Station pioneers have spread outward, like echoes and counter-echoes, on and on. One hundred years of science, a century of service. Who could map such broad influences? One could begin, but the journey would never end.